Cool. <clears throat> so it does appear that we're live. Okay, so there's about a 20 second delay on the video itself. Going live a little early. Going live a little early because uh, I want to uh, make sure I start around 6. And this usually takes a few minutes for me to share and do all that, do all that jazz. So I figured I would come in a little early. <clears throat> Figured I'd come in a little early to uh, get all those shares taken care of as quickly as possible. So once you guys start popping in, uh, we will start getting into the meat of the of the discussions, uh, do the check in and and all that stuff. So if you if you are in the um, in the video a little early, please do me a favor and uh, hit the like button, hit the share button get the word out about this uh, about this video. Uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different interesting topics, I think, today. Uh, do another read-through. I, I, I really had fun doing that read-through. Um, not this past... Uh, <clears throat> not this past week, but the, but the week before that. So... <clears throat> Sorry for me clearing my throat. My throat's been getting dry right before I start. So I did make some tea to to neutralize that to help help with my with my old throat. Oh, I missed one thing that I needed to do. First few minutes are always awkward because. It's just me doing this stuff. <laughs> I don't I don't really have like a staff or anybody to help do all the awkward sharing stuff. So um, pardon the delay. And like I said, if you could share this around, invite some people, you can do that. That's something that you could do is invite some folks um, to view this video. We'll be starting off in just a few minutes. One of the things that I do at the top of these videos is do a check-in about where I am mentally and physically. If you guys want to leave a comment, you can do that. And then because because of the nature of the live video, we can actually uh, check that out. We can and read it together and, and uh, respond to it so everybody's, everybody's on board with what's going on. So... Uh, That'd be cool. You guys can totally leave a comment about how your day is going um, and how you're feeling. And go from there. I have two more groups and then some invites to send out. And then we will be rocking, possibly also rolling. That's something else that we'll do. So let's send out our invites. Some of the regular peeps that I know and come in and watch and leave comments and hang out with everybody. Do do do. This thing changes every week too, so it's always different people that get invited to different stuff. Changes things up on me.
We're almost through the awkward part of this, guys. Hang with me. Bear with me. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you for uh, staying put. We're almost through the awkward stuff. <clears throat> I promise we'll be done with this in just a minute. Technically speaking, it's not 6 p.m. Eastern time, so I technically don't have to start just yet. <laughs> so there is that. a bunch of you popping in hit that share button hit that like button let me put that banner up that would that would do it do, 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 do. boom share banner <laughs> that should do it All right, almost done. Oh, forgot one other people that I know will tune into this. Okay, I think that's good. All right, cool. Let's 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 get into it, you guys. Let's get into it. Uh, a couple of you guys already left some comments. Hello, Dolores. It's good to see you. Good to see you. I'm doing pretty good. Thank you for asking. Jay, it's very good to see you as well. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are going to get this thing cooking. Uh, we're going to get this thing cooking. First and foremost, um, if you haven't done so, make sure you hit that share button, hit that like button. Uh, helps. Uh, it, it, I know it sounds silly, but you know when I talk about this sort of stuff, um, the algorithms don't kick in, and uh, they they actively don't want you talking about non mainstream things. So, uh, with the subject matter that we are going to be addressing today, I, I very much doubt that the algorithm is going to pick it up and let people know that that's what's going to happen. So, if you could hit the like and the share. Uh, that helps videos like this uh, pop up higher in the in the algorithm. Uh, the other thing is, obviously, you don't have to. Some people uh, that are viewing are already sustaining members. But if you would like to, uh, you can donate here. I'm going to put up a link. Um, and uh, that'll that'll help with uh, with these videos, with the things that I create. Uh, so feel free to do that. Feel free to. Make a donation if the spirit moves you. If you uh, if you are able to, I know we're all kind of going through some financial strained times. I know some of you folks have already donated and become sustaining member, and for that, uh, you're you're lovely and you're amazing. Uh, but if you can, feel free to donate. Feel free to become a sustaining member. Sustaining members get a free ticket to uh, all of the virtual stand up comedy shows that I'm doing. So. Uh, there's that. That's fun. That's exciting. Uh, the next one is on May 22nd. The link is um, available uh, in the description, but I'm also going to leave it in the comments. I think I goofed it up. All right, that's fine. Uh, that's okay. But I put I put the links uh, there, and it's in the description. Um, I I took a couple days off. I did a, I did a, a, a the the Citizen Revolution, the very first Citizen Revolution show um, on Friday. It was Friday at 9 p.m. and it went very, very well. It, uh, it was a, it was a, a pretty good success. We had a, a, smi a small, minor little glitch um, that my uh, that my sister and brother-in-law actually helped me uh, sort out once uh, once they were able to like talk to me after the show <laughs> uh, because uh, I kind of I kind of decided like I, I don't pay attention to the chat rooms or anything. Like I'm I'm very very concentrated on doing the show and making sure that I'm. Um, getting it right, and uh, and I don't like have like a production manager or anything. 
So I'm managing like showing the presentation and the video clips and doing all that sort of stuff. Um, so I want to make sure that I have all that stuff. So I, I don't particularly pay attention to the chats, but, um, you know, I, I did figure out that there was one glitch and it was in the order of me sharing my screen of what buttons I was pushing in what order that kind of make, created that snafu. So aside from that, it, it went very, 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 very well. And if you bought tickets uh, and came to check out that show, you can come to the next one on May 22nd for free. Um, if you check your emails, there's an email uh, that I sent after the show, kind of giving you the link and a code uh, to get in for free. Uh, they're only five bucks. Um, and currently, since I have uh, lost all of my tour dates uh, leading right up to uh, August, and there's a very good chance that I will lose a majority of that month as well, based on how things are going, um, based on the sort of irresponsible way that we are handling this crisis, um, it is very likely that I will probably end up losing uh, August as well and have to work on rescheduling everything from the last six months, like basically losing six months of work, um, we start rescheduling that into September and go forward from there. Um, so these virtual shows are kind of the way that I am continuing to do stand up, continuing to tour as it were. Uh, so you can grab a ticket to that. If situations are tight, are difficult, um, please feel free to get a hold of me. And I will very happily and gladly give you a code to get a ticket. The You have to go through the ticket link because that's how I'm going to be able to communicate all the details about the show with you. I'm going to be able to give you a um, an email with the uh, with the link and the and the ID and the password to get into the showroom. Um, this way, we prevent any sort of unwanted visitors. I know it kind of. It, it seems it seems uh, cumbersome, but it's really not. Um, it seems like it's kind of arduous, but it's not. It's it's one extra step um, is all it all it is. And it's two layers of security so that, um, you know, uh, that way we don't we don't get those unwanted visitors. We don't get a bunch of people uh, putting up awful things and trying to ruin people's nights because those those people do exist and those people are people that we have to unfortunately contend with in this world and uh, deal with and um, and so on and so forth. So uh, with that said, uh, yeah, I took I took Saturday and Sunday to uh, kind of have a lighter day. I took that day to kind of have a lighter day, got a couple of miscellaneous things done, uh, much like I did today after I did the research for what we're going to talk about. And I um, actually forgot to do one other thing. All right, maybe I'll get to that when I get to that. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been I've been mildly scattered, as you can tell. I'm trying to like make sure that I'm focused on the right stuff here. Uh, but I have been mildly scattered. Um, I think I kind of I, I stressed myself out about the show. To be honest, I was very concerned about getting it, everything right and learning the material and. Um, being that it was a virtual platform, it's a little bit different. I've done a couple of them with the test show, the fringe show, um, but they're still different and I still get nervous. I don't want to like screw anything up and I feel bad when I do because, you know, you guys like paid to come, come see this thing and I want you guys to have a good professional experience. Um, well, everybody seemed to enjoy it and it was really fun. Um, so I'm going to keep doing them. Um, in June, there's going to be a couple of themed shows. Um, so, uh, like one for Juneteenth, one for like Independence Day, because I won't do anything the weekend of Independence Day, actually, but I uh, will talk about stuff leading up to it. Um, so just things like that. I'm doing it basically every Friday, June, and it's 9 p.m. Eastern. So it's 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, like I said, tickets are available uh, for, for that second show right now. And I'm going to put up the tickets for the June shows. Um, in the next uh, few days. Uh, so yeah, I, I've definitely felt like even though I'm, we're, we're in this quarantine situation, like I've, I'm doing more work <laughs> uh, for, uh, in light of losing 80% of my income, I'm, I'm still doing a lot more work. Um, 
you know, but uh, it's good work. It's fun. Like I, I, I enjoy what I do. Uh, I, and I consider myself lucky to be uh, one of the people that enjoys uh, what they do, like every aspect of, of comedy and touring and creating things. I, I really enjoy what I do. So um, with that in mind, like I said, you can leave your comments and then, and then we'll do this uh, and uh, we'll show, we'll show what the comment is and, and, uh, and, and have a conversation about it, but we'll do that at the end of every segment. So make sure, you know, you guys can totally leave comments um, and I am going to get to them, but I will get to them at the end of each segment so I don't lose the train of thought um, that I'm having and start meandering all over the damn place. So let's uh, let's jump into it. Let's dive into uh, the the first topic that we have um, is remembering Jerry Stiller. And, uh, you know, uh, it sucks whenever these these sort of big name comedy legends um, pass away. Uh, it's a very sad occasion and, and I hope that the Stiller family is, is doing well. They're doing okay with this, with this loss. Um, Jerry Stiller was, uh, I, I mean, I, I honestly, like when I first started doing comedy, I had no idea who this cat was. Um, I remember watching him, uh, in King of Queens. That's where I knew him from. I knew him as Arthur Spooner, uh, you know, and, uh, and he was, he, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I really don't think. I realized what his influence in even my comedy was until much later. Like to, to me, it's the way, like the way that he presented the over the top was always like starting at this very quiet, low, serious tone, right? He pulls you in and then he gets real high about it. And then like, you know, that because and that's the dramatic flair. It's that hyper change up that lead up to it. And um, I do that sometimes in my comedy. And I think it comes from probably from watching Arthur Spooner on King of Queens when I was a kid, right? Like I used to watch that show with my parents uh, on whatever weekday night it would air. Um, and I remember watching that show for years and uh, I, I really enjoyed that show, to be honest. Um, it was relatively well written. The characters were pretty well developed. Uh, but I, like, I, I was mildly annoyed by Arthur Spooner because he was the old grumpy loud guy, right? And I did, don't think I really appreciated what it was um, until you later see, you know, um, later see yourself being affected by it. Um, and I definitely have moments where I where I take it real slow and then I ramp it right up. And I think that's an Arthur Spooner uh, influence. Um, but a, a, I think a comedian that that is probably influenced by Jerry Stiller and that sort of like that pull you in and ramp you up kind of thing is uh, Eddie Pepitone. Um, if you guys are unfamiliar with uh, with Eddie Pepitone and his work. Um, very funny comedian, but Eddie Pepitone will do that same thing where he'll kind of keep it low and then he'll get really high and energy, you know, energetic about it. And he'll kind of explode. Um, and I think that's, that's, a um, uh, that's something that, that has, you know, more modern day comedians have been influenced by, uh, Jerry Stiller there. And, uh, I remember watching him on Seinfeld as well as George Costanza's dad, uh, very entertaining character. Um, and here's the thing. I am not a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld as a, as a stand-up comedian. Not a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld. Big controversial statement being made right there. Not a big fan of the not a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld. I I, I watched his I haven't seen the the newest but I guess a new special came out of his. Sure. Um this is how much I give a shit about Jerry Seinfeld. It's like somebody told me that his his new special came out, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, why not? That's a that's a thing that people can watch." Uh, and uh, um, you know, I uh, I gotta say, I'm not a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld. The I've watched his show as an adult, and uh, I watched it twice as an adult, start to finish. Um, cause I think I, I think my sister gave me the DVDs or I used to own all the DVDs, something along those lines. And I watched it again and I gotta say, every time I watch it, it's like kind of boring to me. It's for the time when it came out, it was pretty revolutionary, but it definitely doesn't hold up in my opinion. 
Um, and I've never particularly been a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld's comedy. Uh, you know who was a, a big Jerry Seinfeld guy is uh, my art teacher. The guy that made this painting was a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld. And I remember uh, when I graduated, I bought him a gift and I bought him uh, the Seinfeld CD that was out uh, at that point. But I've never been a fan of Jerry Seinfeld. But I, but even though I grew up and I watched Seinfeld as an adult and I didn't particularly enjoy the show, um, I always enjoyed Jerry Stiller's character on that show. Uh, I, I I thought he brought a, a, a much more interesting dynamic than any of the other characters on that show do because realistically, like, they're the worst but for whatever reason, I feel like it's always Sunny addresses the uh, addresses like the protagonists are the worst characters ever, much better than Seinfeld did. But with Jerry Stiller, when his character would come in and play George's dad, it's like you get to see where uh, George Costanza gets his neuroses from, um, and it's done so well by Jerry Stiller. He plays that character really, really well. Very entertaining. Um, his career in Zoolander was, uh, his, or I guess his cameo in Zoolander was was fun as well. So, you know, kind of sucks whenever these legends die, and it, um, uh, in in comedy, feels feels like you've you've lost something big there. Um, and and with uh, with Jerry Stiller, I think I think we have. Um, he always he always seemed like a good dude to me. Um, I I always liked what he did, and he seemed very humble and modest. And I feel like that's kind of the thing of comedians from that era um, that came up in that like Dick Van Dyke, uh, you know, uh, old old TV era is that they were pretty nice guys. Most of them were pretty nice guys. I know there's some of them that were like total fucking pricks. Uh, but most of them were pretty nice guys, you know? and I always got that uh, feeling from watching um, Jerry Stiller that he was he was like a good dude, you know. So uh, rest in peace. I, I I hope wherever he is, uh, he is getting uh, getting some rest and uh, enjoying the the afterlife or whatever it might be. Uh, yeah, that was that was the little thing that I wanted to say about Jerry Stiller. Okay. So now we are going to get into uh, the meat, the center, the, the pulpy juice uh, of the um, of our of our uh, of our live video here. Um, the unseen folks affected by the pandemic. This uh, is actually referring to an article that my good friend Eleanor Goldfield wrote for Mint Press News. Um, very, very good article. I'm going to talk about a few things that she addressed in there. Uh, not all of them. Uh, just a few things. I encourage you to go and uh, read the article. Let me uh, try to post the link up um, to the article itself. Uh, because it's an excellent, excellent article. She's She's a great journalist. Uh, she has a show called Act Out that she that she uh, was doing regularly, um, and uh, and she, it's sort of still going. It's as it's it's been going as an audio podcast now uh, because she's writing for Mint Press News a lot more. So um, yeah, I highly encourage you guys to read this article because it's fantastic. It's very well written. But a couple of things that she addresses in there are. Uh, uh, you know, who are the, who are the unseen people that are affected by this pandemic? Um, not just on a, uh, epidemiological level, if that's a word, uh, or I might've just made up a word, uh, but also on a financial level, um, the economic level, because we are seeing a lot of people that are facing economic stress throughout all this. And there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, different identities of people that I don't think we consider on a daily basis of how this pandemic is really affecting them and how the failures of capitalism to handle this pandemic is really affecting these people. So um, the first, the first uh, group of people that she talks about is um, the undocumented folks. There are 10.5 million undocumented workers. 
Um, and right now, these workers are considered essential. They're considered essential workers, right? Uh, because they have to go out there and do the manual labor, uh, keep the agriculture industry going. And, um, the, and the one thing, too, is that people kind of don't realize is like these undocumented workers, they pay taxes, they contribute to this country on a social level, on a cultural level on a political level, right? I mean, we, we see, we see uh, the culture of a lot of undocumented people everywhere, you know, like, like if they're coming from Mexico, then we definitely have a surplus of fucking Tex-Mex food everywhere. We definitely have a surplus of Mexican restaurants everywhere, right? So it's like these cultures do permeate our society. They are in America. They are a part of America. So automatically sitting there and claiming, well, fuck these people and they don't deserve to be here because they didn't come here through the right bureaucratic channels that would have probably kept them out of this country in the first place. Then if that's the case, then, you know, I think you're, you're, you're not understanding the full scope of, um, one, what caused these people to come here, which is probably, uh, has something to do with American imperialism because America likes to fuck with other countries. And there has been a long history of America constantly fucking with other countries, uh, running CIA coups and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, two, like what they have actually brought into this country and what their, uh, you know, quote unquote net worth is in, in terms of the culture that they brought into this country and, and how they've shaped this country. Um, you know, so, so they are, they are, they are the essential workers. They've become the essential workers uh, of America. So, um, they are, they can't even get that $1,200 pittance that the, uh, Democrats and Republicans so graciously signed into, uh, it, 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 into law for us during a global pandemic, when a bunch of people lose their jobs and a, a majority of their income or all of their income here, here's $1,200 for you to ride this whole thing out. Well, they're not even eligible for that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I, I've talked about my thing with, with that 1200, uh, 1200 bucks. It's a stopgap measure at best. That's really all it is. Uh, and I think they're realizing that it's a stopgap measure, you know, um, but they can't even, uh, access unemployment, the undocumented, um, because of their status, because of their immigration status, um, they can't get unemployment, which sucks because that's what five, 600 bucks every week or so, every two weeks or so. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the time frame for getting that is. Uh, but you know, they can't do that because if they do, they risk having to deal with, um, ice or, some other immigrant immigration system. So what are their options? Their choice is they apply for the unemployment and take a risk of dealing with ICE and then getting sent to an, a detention center, which is, which is going to be awful because fuck all. If we treat our prisons properly, our detention centers properly or with care, keep it clean. We don't do that. Um, or they go to work as an essential worker, getting not even really hazard pay. Um, in a lot of these situations, they're not even really getting hazard pay. They're still getting paid under the table and less than minimum wage. In both instances, they have a higher uh, likelihood of being exposed uh, to the virus and getting um, getting this disease. So they're kind of in between a rock and a hard place. It's like, what do you do? You know, and there is no real plan of, um, of how to deal with this situation. Nobody really has a plan of like, what do we do to address the undocumented population uh, that's in America? How do, how do we, how do we go forward with this? Uh, because they don't care. That's, that's sort of the reality of it. The reality of it is, uh, those in power just don't give a shit. The Republicans definitely don't give a shit. The Republicans don't care about anything that has to do with immigration. And the Democrats fold over so quickly to that that they don't really care. 
there's no money in immigration reform. So why would they why would they need to do it? There, there's, there's money in ICE, there's money in these detention centers, because then they can just turn these immigrant detention centers into, you know, prisons for profit, like they do with regular prisons anyway. So there's, so why would they, what the fuck, why would we care? So, you know, the, the, the undocumented, um, these folks are in, in trouble. And, uh, and there doesn't really seem to be any sort of network or uh, provision to be put into place to help these folks out. Um, another thing that, I mean, this has been going around, really, I, I've, I've seen more information about this on like my Facebook feed than I have um, in like any sort of like corporate or mainstream media. I barely seen anything in, in corporate or mainstream media is about domestic violence. Uh, 20 large metro cities saw double digit jumps of calls regarding domestic violence in April. Double digit jump. To me, I mean, I, I have a solution. I don't know if, if it's the solution, but I think it's something that we can take a look at is... I mentioned this in regards to to tr figuring out what we can do with uh, like releasing prisoners, but this this might be a more palatable option. Is um, you know shelters are becoming uh, overloaded because of this because there has been a, a high jump in domestic violence cases. And nobody should be in that environment. If 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 you're in an abusive situation, you know uh, that that one it fucking super sucks. And two, nobody should be put in that situation. Um, nobody should be uh, should be physically or emotionally or mentally abused in in that way. That's that's just a shitty thing to do to your fellow human being, especially a fellow human being that you claim to love unequivocally. Like doing that to somebody is just like. It's just like the height and height height of of shittiness, right? Um, it sucks, and I think because we're seeing these numbers go up, what what you could do because these shelters are also starting to get overloaded, what you could do is um, you could convert some of the unused hotels into additional shelter spaces. Uh, I mentioned that for prisoners and there were a few people that regularly watched uh that were just like well i don't know if that's the best idea i think it's 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 cool that your head went there but i don't know if that's the best idea um but it but it might be a little bit more it might be a little bit more sensible to use the unused hotels for as as sort of domestic abuse shelters uh you know and part of it Two is you could you could do a little bit of a reformation on the criminal justice system as well, uh, where you could have cops like I don't know, uh, post up as guards for these domestic abuse victims instead of being abusers themselves, right? Instead of accosting minorities who can't afford to wear a mask and dragging them off of buses. Maybe you could actually do something, I don't know, positive. Maybe, maybe, maybe you could do that whole protect and serve thing that your badge says. By protecting victims of domestic abuse while they're being sheltered in, a, in an unused hotel during a pandemic. Just spitballing some ideas out here, people. You know, I'm, I'm not running for office. I can't run for office. I don't got no money uh to, to to do that but just just trying to spitball an idea out there uh but you know the, the the what it really comes down to is will these large corporate hotels um will they do something like that if that idea even gets proposed will they do something like that and i and you know it would be it i i would probably see a lot of resistance to this idea from any sort of corporate hotel chain right like the fucking hilton like who's using the fucking hilton right now or holiday inn right like or or whatever name name a hotel the the bayview inn and suites uh that's a hotel chain i've stayed at before fucking red roof inns 
You know, like they're not, they're, no, who's using that right now, right? Like we're all kind of in these stay-at-home orders or some of the stay-at-home orders are shifting to like yellow alerts or whatever the fuck color system uh, that the government likes likes to do, you know, to use. Is these, but these corporate hotels, they're like, they're not going to, they're, they're just like, well, where's the money? Where Where's the money? And it's like, oh, but don't you think that it would feel good to just like help people? Yeah, I help people when there's money involved. You know, and if that's the case, right, if they're if 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 they the Hilton chain is concerned about money, why don't you just ask your pimps in the government to fund you? They didn't they didn't hesitate to bail out corporations in the very beginning of all this. Maybe you could open up your doors to help domestic shelters and then and then go to your pimps and be like, look, we're helping money, please. Speaking of our uh, next topic of people that are uh, unseen folks that are affected by this are sex workers uh, who are primarily single mothers and they are excluded from the bailout bill because America has a moral compass. You guys, did you guys know that? Are you aware of that? This is news to me. America has a moral compass. Boy, it must be buried in some fucking back shelf of a back shelf. Somewhere deep in a bunker in central Montana, that moral compass. You know, we don't see it very often. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're like, ah, sex workers. We can't we can't include them with a bailout. They're primarily single mothers, but you know, we can't include morality. I got Jesus. You know, Jesus is somewhere. He's around. He's probably he's probably around. Well, guess what? Jesus slept with a sex worker. All right. Yeah. I bet Jesus would be like, hey, include him in the fucking bailout bill. <laughs> My girlfriend was a sex worker, so maybe quit being a bunch of piece of shit. <laughs> you know, but they did. They excluded them because of the purient sexual nature of the work. Well, uh, that is that is the uh, um, that is the 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 quote that they've used. But it's okay. But guys, relax. Uh, we did spend one point three two million dollars on fighter jets to fly over uh, various different cities in order to thank, in order to thank uh, our healthcare workers. Uh, as Eleanor Goldfield points out in that article that I shared, uh, sex sells, but war pays, right? And who doesn't? Come on. And that is a very accurate statement because who doesn't like uh, an ad? With the with the very scantily clad, bosomy woman uh, riding a bomb, right now that makes you want to buy that bomb. You gotta buy that bomb. Your boner wants you to buy that bomb, you guys. Okay, you gotta blow some people up. And how much of the how much of that bomb sales go to pay uh, the woman? Nothing, because she is a dirty, dirty whore. Okay, and this is a Christian nation. All right. And and we gotta we gotta hold on to the sanctity of life. Emphasis on the titty and sanctity. Am I right, huh, fellas? Where are my fellas at, huh? Look, America is a country that cherishes life, so we have to make weapons to regulate that life. It only makes sense. It only makes sense. And how can we regulate life if we don't have explosives? Duh, guys. This is American War Economies one hundred and one. This is like the basics of what they teach you when you join the Pentagon. This is like orientation at the Pentagon, you guys. <laughs> but this is a result of like what a war economy actually does, right? Like you have you have a whole group of people that could use your help and you're like, what if we spent most of our money on something that virtually does nothing for anybody? What if what if we did that? <laughs> right? <laughs> like this is this is an economy run on war, hubris, and like imperialistic destruction. That's essentially all that's all that's run on. It's just like this is an economy run on like uh, nationalistic pride and displays of unwarranted power. And instead of spending your money on like actual, actual shit that people need, that actual people things that people need, one point three two million dollars. One point three two million dollars could have gotten sixty six ventilators going at twenty thousand dollars a piece. 
You could have used 1.3, uh, you could have gotten 1.32 million N95 masks at a dollar a piece uh, or $1,100, $1,200 checks. And I bet you 1,100 sex workers or 1,100 undocumented immigrants um, and uh, 1,100 uh, single moms could have fucking used that 1,200 bucks. I still see people that haven't received their checks, that haven't gotten a direct deposit in their in their accounts. Instead, you literally spend it on the most pointless fucking thing you could do, which is uh, which is fighter jets to thank medical professionals. What an insane sentence I've been forced to say. <laughs> <laughs> It's just the, it's just like that, who did that help? <laughs> who did that help? But you have to justify this, right? You have to justify this war economy. You have to justify the increase of the war budget that, that we have to see. Oh, you can't just let it go. You gotta, we gotta, we gotta justify this shit. So you gotta do anything to utilize the military. We literally, there's the whole world is causing calling for ceasefires, and America is like, but we have bombs we have to explode. We made all of these bombs. We can't just not explode them. That's rude to the bombs. These the the bosomy lady. Do you remember? Because that's she wanted you to explode the bombs. <laughs> Instead of like reallocating this enormous, ridiculous military budget, instead of reallocating it to things we actually need, like food or water or health or shelter, we, we do these pointless displays. <laughs> do these insane pointless displays. That, that's what we should be, that's, as a government, that's what they should do. They should be spending their money on food, water, health, and shelter. That's that's where the that's where the finances should be allocated to. This is not all depressing. The the next segment is going to show you guys like what uh, what we're all doing and and how we can all help each other. So uh, comments. Let's let's look at some of the comments. Hello, hello, Swatala. Good to see you. Uh, have you ever stayed at a Red Roof Inn? All the hotels and motels I've stayed they stayed at never a Red Roof Inn. I like Red Roof Inns. <laughs> there is a particular charm in how shitty Red Roof Inns are. Uh, in one of my albums, I I reference a Red Roof Inn particularly because I enjoy staying in them. Uh, I get weirded out at nice hotels. You know, like if if a hotel is too ritzy, I'm just nervous that I'm gonna break some shit. And I get scared about that. So, like, I like, I like staying in a red roof inn. It's kind of fun. <laughs> I'm not arguing for the Republicans with this next comment. At least the Republicans are upfront about their stance on illegal immigration. Pissed me off that the Democrats say they're for uh, immigration, but mostly in words. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. I do. I disagree with what the Republicans have to say, but I do appreciate their honesty in being like, yeah, we don't give a shit. <laughs> like, like they just come out and they're like, we're not going to do anything. In fact, if you try to do something, we'll take one of our red states and try to sue the president, which is what they did uh, under the Obama administration when he came out and said he was for amnesty. Um, and people forget this is that Obama had the largest amount of deportations of any president in the last two decades. Uh, which is crazy. And in 2009, under Obama is when we created ICE, which we did not need. And if you talk to like, there there have been interviews done with uh, Border Patrol agents that kind of look at ICE and they're just like, why is this a thing? Like, this is like, I don't understand why this is a thing. Like, they're so confused about the, the reason why ICE exists. Other other than to me, it, it just looks like they're trying to use immigration to uh, turn it into like the prison industrial complex. They're trying to be like, well, we haven't made money out of uh, off of, you know, persecuting undocumented immigrants. What if we did that? Like, that's kind of what it feels like. But I mean, Obama came up with with, with the notion of, of amnesty and then never fucking did anything about it. And there was a case where Texas, like, I think the governor of Texas or something was like, we're going to sue Obama. <laughs> Everybody's like, what are you talking about? He's like, They're, he's trying to get illegals into this country. That's what he's trying to do. And it's like, that's not what the bill says at all. But that's the thing is like, they come out and they're just like, yeah, we're, we're going to be ignorant 
to immigrants. Like that's kind of what Republicans do. I mean, Brian Kemp, I think had the most honest, uh, like it was honest to how insane it was, which goes to show who Brian Kemp might be as a human being, uh, where he, he said that he wanted to, uh, go around the state of Georgia, pick up a bunch of illegal immigrants throw them in the back of his truck and then drive down to the border in Texas and release them into the wild. Like that's just a, that's just a policy this guy had. And he was just like, yep, this is what I plan on doing. <laughs> and there were a bunch of people that were like, yeah, it sounds like a good play. It sounds like a good, good play. Oh, it's crazy. All right, our final uh, thing is um, we're going to talk a little bit more about mutual aids, which uh, is something that corporate media will not address or talk about at all. I have not seen one corporate media address the notion of mutual aids. And if you bear with me for just one moment, um, I forgot to do this. So that's that's on me. Ha, there it is. Cool. Okay, so that's the article there. And I'm just gonna read through it and uh, and we'll run through uh, a couple of uh, couple of comments. Uh, I'll, I'll intermittently go through. I did this last week and I had a really, really good time. Oh, one more comment. Texas was that was that state. I think there were some others too. Yeah, I I know there. It was it was like the wildest thing, and and there's like a whole rule where it's like you're you're not supposed to sue the president. <laughs> like, I think Nix. I think it was like something along with Nixon, where they were like there was there would have been so many cases against Nixon. They were just like you can't sue the president while he's in duty. There's just too many lawsuits. Uh, but uh, let's let's look at the mutual aid. Uh, Mutual aid piece here. Uh, that's the wrong screen. Okay, so uh, the article comes from a website called wagingnonviolence.org. Uh, I read through this this piece today, and I wanted to read it through with you guys, and then we'll kind of stop, and uh, I'll give you guys like my thoughts on what we just read, and then uh, if this thing starts running a little bit long. Um, I'll stop and look at your comments in, in between because it, it breaks it up into a couple different sections. So I'll have time to kind of look at your comments and, and respond to them uh, in the interim of reading the article itself. So it'll kind of break things up a little bit. Uh, so the title is Amid the Coronavirus Crisis, Mutual Aid Networks Erupt Across the Country. Uh, and this is from the end of March. Uh, this is how long shit's been. Th this, I mean, th things have been going on well before this. Um, you know, there, there have been mutual aids. Uh, in practice for for quite some time, but especially now, like things have kind of ramped up, they've gone to the next level. Uh, so this is from the end of March, and you know this is an idea that I I don't particularly see uh, a lot of highlight on. So let us read. Uh, as the first coronavirus cases came to Washington State, the government response was both slow and confused. That's when the community members knew they were going to have to build something themselves if they wanted to get through this pandemic. If we recognized that uh, we couldn't rely on the current systems in place and, and needed to take care of each other directly, said Janelle Walter of the Tacoma Mutual Aid Collective, an all volunteer organization of community members sharing resources. Mutual aid means creating a network that can be mobilized immediately without needing permission. Eleanor Goldfield, who we just talked about, uh, has been helping out with the DC mutual aid and uh, has been one of the few voices that have addressed uh, mutual aids. Uh, set right near Puget Sound, Tacoma is a working class city uh, down the road from Seattle that does not have a large left wing political scene like other West Coast metropol metropolises. I think that's how you pronounce that. Uh, they were hit with the first wave of what would become a nationwide and global pandemic, shutting down social services, forcing people out of their jobs and leaving entire communities struggling to hold on. This was a crisis of catastrophic proportions that no one was prepared to deal with. And it came on like an avalanche over a couple of days. 
Tacoma Mutual Aid Collective formed quickly and from people who wanted to create a strong system for supporting the most affected and immediately started doing grocery and prescription pickups and deliveries for people who could not risk going out into public. They began a Saturday grocery and school uh, supply distribution in front of the local McCarver Elementary School where families could drive up, grab what, grab what they needed and head out without violating a new uh, without violating the new rules of social distancing. The goal was to listen to those they shared the 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 neighbors with are sorry, I'm gonna reread that sentence. The goal was to listen to those they shared the uh, the neighbors with to hear what people needed and to start a system of sharing. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is what my buddy uh, Pierre Vachon does. Uh, shout out to Pierre Vachon, very funny comedian uh, and entertainer. He does this thing called a quarantine show almost every single night. Um, but I'm pretty sure this is how Pierre spends his days. He creates stuff for people. Like he's sending me masks for, for me and my mom. He delivers groceries and prescriptions to people in their community. Like he and he's not part of like DoorDash or whatever. He'll just go and, and pick up stuff for, for people. So um, uh, it's kind of like like he's like a one man mutual aid machine which is pretty fucking cool uh mutual aid is community walter explained relying on each other's relying on each other builds trust and capacity it re removes the need for paternalistic approaches uh to aid uh like we see with nonprofits and other state programs we are seeing mutual aid projects pop over all over, several here in Tacoma, and it's because folks are realizing that our systems collapse in emergency situation, whether it be a pandemic or a natural disaster. Systems that are already inefficient and officials who are already incompetent uh, are unable to meet basic human needs, so we take care of each other. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason why they fail is in in a, in a pandemic or a disaster situation, like profit motives have to be set aside. Um, you 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 are going to see a loss of profit as a as a corporation. But in, in to, to me, it's one of those things where it's like, well, yeah, no shit, because people need help. Like at this point, like you don't need to make money, you know, like there there have been dozens of times but over dozens of times in my career where I've just like foregone a paycheck for a gig uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, which are like essentially big money nights to help out a charity, to help out uh, a, a, you know, a, a community driven, whatever to, to raise some funds, to help a library, to help a cancer support group. Like, yeah, you just do that sort of stuff. Like when people are going through a tough time, like sometimes you just don't, need to make money and it's part of the reason why when i'm doing these virtual shows i'm like hey if you are struggling hit me up i will gladly give you a free ticket because you know for as for how cheesy it sounds it's like we are in this together like everybody is going through a really tough time and if you need you know an hour to just laugh at how absurd this political system is then yeah i got your back you know like come come hang out with some cool people and uh, and 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 be a part of a little virtual community. It's, it'll be pretty rad. So this section is called uh, the community of helping. The United States, the world's largest economy, has been driven to practical halt as every single state is dealing with outbreaks of a deadly coronavirus called COVID nineteen. That's pretty not exactly accurate. The virus is called SARS CoV two. The disease is called COVID nineteen whatever the who fucked up that that's that's the who the way they released that information was kind of fucked up anyway that's an aside that's just an aside it's a little minor thing of just like but it's not it's not 100% accurate <laughs> as the global death toll rises to tens of thousands and people are reminded of earlier flu pandemics that knocked percentage points uh, off the world's population governments have scrambled to figure out what the best course of action could be the bureaucracy has left many communities behind, particularly as shelter orders come down and businesses close, leaving many people without income to support their families. This is one of the worst case scenarios for a public health threat 
and most communities have been left to fend for themselves. A lot of the communities we talked about in our prior segment, right? The the undocumented community, uh, people that are living in abusive situations are kind of, you know, in, in a precarious situation, well, in, in a much more precarious situation. Um, you have sex workers that are ineligible to get, uh, you know, get any sort of aid because of because of morality. Uh, so, you know, who helps them out is is things like mutual aids. They can turn to mutual aids and say, hey, I need I, I, I don't have food this week. And they'll deliver you a bunch of food that, that you can that you can utilize to feed your families, because as we saw, uh, people that are in sex work, a lot of them are um, single moms. So, you know, they have kids that that need to be taken care of. OK, we'll keep reading. The clarity of this situation has led people active in their community, some political and some simply looking for the best tools for survival to start developing a series of mutual aid groups to help each other uh, meet their basic needs. Mutual aid is the idea that humans should help humans, even and especially outside any market forces, said uh, Brett O'Shea of the Nebraska Left Coalition, who also hosts the podcast Re Revolutionary Left Radio. Human cooperation, solidarity, and communalism is built deep into our DNA, and mutual aid is just what the aspect of humanity looks like in practice. I agree with that statement. I think this is sort of just... this. This mutual aid to me is... Uh, it's all volunteer run and it's all donation based. So whatever whatever folks can donate in terms of like um, supplies, food, things of that sort, or money in general, um, yeah, that's kind of what they live on. They live on donations. Like no one's making money off of this. This is truly just altruism and humans helping humans because humans need help. Um, you know, um, how many more times can I say help and humans in one sentence? Uh, uh, we will not go down that rabbit hole. Uh, but yeah, I think this is this is sort of like one of the truest forms of altruism and compassion. And all those things have become like acts of a revolution. When you when you throw profit aside uh, to a system that's purely driven on profit and and worships the market like it's a religion. Uh, yeah, this is this is as revolutionary as it fucking gets. <clears throat> so let us keep reading. Mutual aid is the idea that when we support each other, when we support each other's needs in a reciprocal relationship, but without the obligation uh, or exchange, we have the best chance to survive and flourish. Mutual aid's projects have been a staple of radical social movements for decades, from food distribution services like Food Not Bombs to survival pending revolution programs of the Black Panthers, which included free clinics and free breakfast programs. Uh, when the state fails to meet the needs of the public, many communities will build resources themselves, and in doing so, will build an alternative to hierarchical bureaucracies in the government. And that is why this is so dangerous, by the way, is because it makes you less dependent on, um, on, on these bureaucracies. And regarding the Black Panthers, I'm working on a much larger piece about this right now, uh, but I, I want a big chunk of it to be about these survival projects, uh, these, these survival, um, the, the survival pending revolution uh, of, of the Black Panther Party that was started by Bobby Seale. That was Bobby Seale's sort of um, organizing methodology. That's when J. Edgar Hoover, another paranoid man, um, targeted them and decided to use COINTELPRO to destabilize uh, this thing because because the especially the free breakfast program for kids went, for lack of better. Uh, it went viral. I'm sorry. I'm, I had to say it, but, but like it kind of spread very quickly. They were teaching people in various different cities how to make something like this happen. And that's when J. Edgar Hoover, who was scared of a black messiah, um, was, used COINTELPRO to infiltrate the, the Panthers and try to break them up from the inside out, which it, to, to some respects, he, he did succeed in doing that. But I mean, the, he, he was a paranoid man thinking that there was going to be a black messiah that was going to come down and create like a race war and take 
the white man out of out of power. I, I don't really know. It's, it, it, it's it's mildly confusing and also kind of white supremacist at the same time. <laughs> but that's why it's so dangerous, though. It subverts bureaucracy. It subverts us needing to depend on a broken system that is not intent on that's not really intent on um, um, sharing anything with us. It's not really intent on um, helping each other out. It's it's very much intent on keeping its position of power uh, intact and in place without us just depending on each other. And the, and mutual aid kind of subverts all that shit uh, because this is this is literally getting food to people's mouths as directly as you possibly can. Right where we had like Nancy Pelosi in the very beginning of all this on like March 16th, uh, Steve Mnuchin and Trump were like, maybe we should give direct checks every single month during this crisis to American citizens. And Nancy Pelosi was like, bah, but no, but we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't, we should make them, you know, basically go and run around and create these tax incentive things. Like, and it was just like, how is this helping people? Uh, I, I think I missed this illustration. Uh, that's a pretty adorable illustration. Solidarity, not charity. Yeah. Aid, activism, education. Uh, this is very cool. Okay. Mutual aid is a reciprocal, respectful relationship, and it is distinct from charity or government programs, says Devin Sertas of the Triangle Mutual Aid in Piedmont, North Carolina. Uh, mutual aid avoids the bureaucratic inefficiencies we often see in governments and large non-governmental organization and instead hopes to build community. Uh, every event that stresses our systems, uh, every event that stresses our system forces us to choose. Will we hoard toilet paper and sanitizer, bolt the door and embrace the National Guard curfews? Mutual aid chooses instead to plant gardens, pool our resources, prioritize those most in need, and protect those uh, most vulnerable. Gee, kind of like how a government system is supposed to fucking operate. <laughs> in almost every city around the United States, mutual aid networks have started fr uh, started to form, ranging from uh, projects for resource distribution to simple options like fundraising, compiling lists of resources and contacts, and creating chat threads so people in the same area can stay in contact with the, one another. The speed with which these groups have arrived and the depth of care many of them offer have started to show what options communities have when the large institutions fail and are unwilling to deal with disaster. Now, this is incredible because this is like using technology in a positive way. And there's a lot of people like I'm friends with a bunch of people that are like terrified of technology and with good reason, because, you know, they use it to like spy on people and uh, and uh, for intelligence agency networks and stuff. This is a way that you can use technology to create a positive change um, in a society. Because, I mean using these sort of like chat threads and compiling resources and text chains and, you know, uh, encrypted messaging and things of that sort. Like they've essentially built a movement in every single city under the core idea of compassion, altruism, and helping your fellow man. Uh, that's amazing. Meanwhile, most of, I'm pretty sure I'm getting this correctly, but most of like social security is, is run on like floppy disk technology. <laughs> yeah. I remember what floppy disks are. I don't know if, 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 if there are youngsters watching that know what, what floppy disks are, if I can, if I can hike my old man pants up a little bit, just you, you youngsters don't know what that floppy disk was all about. Let me tell you about the floppies. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, whatever you, whatever people like complain, and they're like, "Hey, why don't you uh, improve the technology uh, of these social services?" They're like, "But the money and the things, and what do we do with?" And then there's the Snapchats. Is that involved? Should we involve the Snap and the chats? And they're just like, "Can you just make like a website that works? Is that possible? Can you get it off of like Angel Fire and go to like I don't know, like a WordPress thing? Can you just?" 
can you can you like can you listen to like a fucking Mark Marin podcast and get a Squarespace code and fucking use that to 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 create a better website? Like to, just just something, just fucking something. And they're like, well, I gotta eject the floppy disk and maybe get a new. I don't know. Are they still making floppies? Like also, um, and something else to 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 take into into account with the history of the Black Panthers is. Um, I think almost like a decade after the survival programs were put into place uh, with the free breakfast and everything like that notion under the Nixon administration was approved. The government was almost a decade behind a radical socialist, like underground mutual aid network that, that are deemed to be terrorists, by the way. <laughs> Their true legacy is creating like a an effective mutual aid network, and they're deemed as terrorists because J. Edgar Hoover was scared of a black messiah, and Nixon was paranoid about some other shit. But a decade later, he created uh, like the Breakfast in School program uh, that came from the Black Panther Free Breakfast program that started a decade earlier. But you know, that's not that's not really taught about the Black Panthers. That's not what the Black Panthers are associated with. I'm going to take a look at the comments real quick. We got one comment. Oh, I'm going to switch over to the screen. Uh, my kids are starting. Uh, my kids are currently watching Wonder, and my first grader came in and asked me what flop. <laughs> uh, it must have been in a movie. I'm not surprised they still use them in the government. It, yeah, it's the craziest thing, because I remember reading the story and just being like, what is happening? <laughs> like, like there's, there's no way that that's, that can be real. <laughs> Like it's so wild. I remember having them too. I remember it one. I think like the very first laptop we ever had uh, had, had floppy disks. Like it's it's too it's it's like farcical at this point. All right, let's let's get back into the article. Uh, getting what we need. The COVID-19 crisis is unlike many others because it affects everyone, shuts down businesses and government in a massive sweep and prevents us from coming together because of the risk of cross-infection. This has created an urgent need for uh, resources uh, that is massive in scope, including everything from medical supplies to food and childcare. This is why many of the groups that first formed focus on centralizing all their resource all the resources that were available letting people know how to get a hold of each other and any services uh that are at their disposal you know what else this this notion of getting like they connect certain people like if um like if you're living in an apartment building and apartment 2b has two people working from home each making sixty thousand dollars they're doing okay but apartment e 3e has both people that lost their income or a majority of their income and are struggling to get by and they don't know what they're going to do to feed their kids. Well, they go, Hey, have you met people in 2B? Cause they're doing okay. Maybe they can help you guys out and they connect them. Uh, there is a church run by a gentleman named Mike Mather in Indianapolis. My friend Stuart Huff told me about this. And this concept has constantly been ringing in the back of my head for like three years um, Stuart told me that he has some, uh, uh, Mike Mather has somebody in his church called a professional listener and he just goes around the neighborhood and he listens to people and he takes in their stories. And if there's something that he hears where two people can help each other out, he connects those two people. That's his whole fucking job. And that to me is like, what a necessary job that we need right now. Like what a, what an amazing job to have, especially in the face of a crisis. Right. And I, and I know I've mentioned this before is if something works in the moment of a crisis, there's a very good likelihood that it's going to work in in regular non crisis circumstances. So like this definitely works in a non crisis circumstance. Um, so whenever they whenever they talk about like connecting people and stuff, it just it automatically reminds me of the professional listener and how incredible of a fucking idea that is. Um, Stuart Huff, by the way, comedian, everybody should uh, check out because he's amazing. Um, so 
Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, this project is serving as a hub or clearinghouse of information as opposed to other organizations which are directly providing aid. We do not have the people, time, or money to directly provide assistance, but we can help you find the resources that they need, uh, said Andy, Ru Andy Ruto of the NYC United Against Coronavirus, which came together on March 12th to create a master resource document. Uh, I believe we have already past the point where our governments at the city, state, and national level can adequately meet the needs of society under this ongoing coronavirus pandemic. That means that, that we will need to take care of each other and we will need to keep each other safe. Honestly, like, I, I have only survived to the base point of what I've survived through is through the generosity of people that donated, became patrons, fucking bought albums and, and bought tickets to, to the virtual shows. It has nothing to do with the government. Like the government has done dick all for me. Like I'm one of those people that can't really get the gig, gig worker unemployment. Can't really, I don't, I don't want to get this, uh, even try to get the small business loans because it's not for me. Um, and I, and I'm, pr you know, probably wasn't, uh, eligible for the 1200 bucks and if i was it went to my ex anyway so it's like i i've essentially kind of seen the generosity of people and why things like mutual aids actually fucking work like i have seen that happen so it's very cool like this and it, that's exactly what he's saying it, you know it's just like people coming together people learn about what people need and and coming through for each other um so yeah, uh, COVID-19 can affect some people with underlying health conditions uniquely hard, so it's up to many people in the mutual aid organization to volunteer to do errands for them, such as picking up and delivering groceries. Uh, many of the organizations have created a system where volunteers can sign up to do specific duties or shift shifts, um, and uh, then they can connect the people in need uh, with the people offering the aid. So again, that kind of goes back to that concept of the professional listener. Every day we are getting endless amounts of volunteers, said Kevin Van Meter, who is working with the Benton County Family Response Team in Corvallis, or Oregon. All these are kind of smaller towns too, by the way. Um, this mutual aid organization was started by the Coalition of Graduate Employees, a graduate student union at the Oregon State University, which has been doing mutual aid uh, before the crisis to help support the struggling student workers. Now they have uh, 150 volunteers ready to do runs, more than, <laughs> more than the requests are coming in. Uh, that's probably changing now for the fact that this stuff is starting to shut down. People are having to stay at home. Uh, people are having a stay at home order. The crisis is deepening um, in their own lives and now they have to lean on these services like never before, Ren Meter added. The mutual aid network of a Ypsilanti or many, oh, that's really cool, um, in Michigan predated the crisis and was created uh, by people involved in other organizations, including the coalitions of Emulkily Workers, Mutual Aid Disaster Relief, and the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, many, which actually has a 5013C or C. C3 status was able to respond quickly to the pandemic because they had already been doing the work of building community connections in advance of uh, doing support work for local food pantries and providing meals. Ypsilanti has faced tough economic circumstances and uh, that many cities in the Rust Belt have with 30% poverty rate and 13% of the students being homeless. Oof. Uh, before the coronavirus hit, the community was still grasping for resources that were not available uh, through government programs. Because we've spent the last year building inten intentionally, we plan on responding to the pandemic with the same slow-moving progress uh, we've used to build this project out, said Peyton McDonald, an organizer with many. We are committed to a solidarity, not charity approach to organizing and won't claim to be expert on mutual aid since we believe that it is uh, an inherent part of life. It's important to stress that we don't give mutual aids to less fortunate. Our existing programs are still taking off and this is a global crisis. Uh, this, and this global crisis is testing their limits. 
yeah, so that's an interesting statement that they don't they don't particularly help um, the the less fortunate. Uh, you know, so that's kind of a that's kind of an interesting statement to make. I think they just help people that need to be helped. Health resources are particularly scarce, including basic sanitation tools such as cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, uh, which were sold out in many places within days of the pandemic starting, which was crazy to me. Like I, uh, that that still is wild. That like the second we say the word pandemic, everybody's like, we gotta get all the toilet paper. It was just like you don't think every, other people need it. Maybe you just need like two. Just get two and fucking leave. In Portland. Groups organized in a coalition, including the Democratic Socialists of America, Symbiosis, Pop Mob, and Portland Action Medics have begun <clears throat> a network that delivers resources and creates materials from scratch, including making their own hand sanitizer and World Health Organization recipe. <clears throat> By the way, I think my buddy Pierre in, uh, in Middlebury, Vermont, does this for people in his city. Great guy, that Pierre Vachon. Good guy. <clears throat> a really simple thing you can do is contribute to any efforts to get food or sanitation supplies out into the community. We need to we need to slow the spread, which means making it easier for people to avoid close proximity and keep their hands clean. Said uh, ILA, the, a street medic who was helping to put on a resource fair to hand out important tools before the shelter at home orders were put into place. Each of our actions affects others. We are all on this planet together. We are all in this pandemic together and we need to start acting like it. The more we take care of each other, the better off we will all be. I think that's a very fair statement. I, although, you know, a lot of people don't kind of see it that way. I feel like that's sort of the misguided shift of... Um, like the lockdown protesters that, you know, that were all kind of like faced with trying to understand this concept and just couldn't fathom it. Um, and then we're just like, I got to get the haircuts. What if I become a hippie? Like, and then it's just like, yeah, maybe, maybe you should become a hippie. Uh, seems like it'll be pretty cool. Volunteers from the network are distributing supplies, including hand sanitizers, and working to create dependable drop-off locations that people will know and visit. This honestly, like at this point, mutual aid networks have like two hundred times more organization skills than the federal government does. <laughs> like, like Nancy Pelosi is like, we got to do like means testing to see if if this compassion thing is going to work. Like, what if? But I gotta, I gotta compare my stacks of money to my stacks of ice cream to my stacks of compassion, and then I just knock the compassion away. So it's like we can't even mean test because I keep kicking the compassion, <laughs> and and here we are, just like people, just organized, getting together and fucking getting shit done, you know. <laughs> As 3.3 million people are laid off because of the of coronavirus closures, they need. The need for money is going to become as pressing as food and medicine. That is why several of the mutual aid organizations have simply prioritized fundraising efforts to get money where it's most needed. The Baltimore Mutual Aid and Emergency Relief Fund was created by members of the Food, Clothing, and uh, Resistance Collective, Maroon Movement, which formed in 2015 to do ongoing mutual aid work like food distributors, uh, garden support projects, and group meals. We are part of the community as opposed to some outside entity doing charity work or bougie handouts, explained member Seema Lee, who was inspired to get involved because of the basic need resources that many marginalized communities have, particularly communities with indigenous people of color. We are looking for we are looking out for our people. We are fiercely anti-capitalist. So we, our work emphasizes doing things in a cooperative manner without money always being involved. Cool. They have also been working with Baltimore Safe Haven to support sex workers during this crisis who have had the added difficulty of finding shelters and being without income. We talked about this earlier in the segment. Our examples and my personal mentors were the Black Panther Party and their survival programs that would help 
take uh, take care of the needs of the, the, the take care of the needs the state would neglect while also providing political education in the process. We are about horizontal power for the people. We don't just show up at a disaster for a photo op. Uh, we are always here. Uh, by the way, I, that kind of reminded me is, did, I don't know if you guys saw this or not, but it's like an insane video of Mike Pence uh, picking up like an empty box for the cameras and he was like mic'd and he said it into the mic. <laughs> the video got released. And he was like, what? and they're like, hey, the box is empty. And he's like, what if I just picked up this empty box and it looked good for the cameras? And they were like, sure, fine. I guess that's a thing you could do. Fine, sure. <laughs> like it's just it's so crazy anyway as these projects sprout up or build on the work uh they have already been doing people are building new methods of coordinating between them and are trying to construct relationships to allow these groups to be dependable beyond the next few weeks adam greenberg created the covid19 mutual aid coordinate coordination slack channel an instant message service uh popular in the tech world to start building those bridges between groups so people would have a central place to share resources. My hope is that with the uh, with this Slack, organizers can make their needs known and people can swarm uh, towards what makes sense for them. This could look like uh, more modular distribution templates for direct needs uh, based needs-based aid or consolidation around a set of progressive demands to keep our community safe. The difficulty will be in responding to circumstances that are changing quickly, particularly when the response from the public officials and law enforcement changes daily. All right, I'm gonna look at some comments. Additional comment. Uh, during the Great Depression, Henry Ford had a company policy that only one spouse could be employed at Ford Motor. His stated goal was to get as many families with at least one parent employed. That's interesting. I, I know Henry Ford was, uh, as is with all these people, is like they, they do a couple things right and then they do a couple things wrong. That's interesting. I don't think I knew that about Henry Ford. That's a cool, that's, a, that's an interesting fact. Um, yeah. That's cool. Oh, before, got to get it back to that right screen. A radical imagination. While the practical utility of these mutual aid groups is what has received attention and inspired participation, the motivation runs a lot deeper for many of the organizers involved. As income inequality increases and periods of climate and economic crisis expand, uh, many are feeling pulled to build a strong community that can remain vibrant uh, as much as it centers the bonds of solidarity. In a world where preparing for disaster or prepping has a lot of consumer cash, uh, those who practice mutual aid believe that it is actually the relationships and com commitment of support uh, support people rely rely on that is most critical to our survival. Yeah, I feel like prepping is a very like individ in individualistic thing. Um, where it's just like, I got to get all the beans. Got to get all the beans for the future because the future is going to depend on beans. That's going to be our currency in the future. It's like, I don't, I don't know if it is. Okay, quote. Um, this can serve as a model for others because we hope to provide an impetus to overcome the cultural inertia associated with individualism, explained the prison support and anti-fascist group Nashville Anarchist Black Cross. That's kind of a badass name. Um, in a recent interview, if anything positive can be gleaned from the COVID-19 outbreak, it's that our bodies are extremely connected and we should be more mindful of the numerous ways we can we can and do love collectively. Uh, that is empowering us to recognize that we are only as strong as the most vulnerable in our community. Therefore, we all need to take part in actions to protect the community as a whole. They've used their resources to create hygiene packs, hand sanitizer, and other tools to hand out to anyone who needs them with the understanding that fighting a pandemic requires everyone's participation and that everyone needs support. The coming weeks are going to be difficult, yet actual Results will depend on how many people on, on the ground respond. For radical activists at the center of 
many of these projects, there, there is a desire to simply apply the principles that have been learned from social movements to do their best to support their communities in crisis. In doing so, they can open the door to, to the world they want to build, one that puts value on each member of the community and finds its strength and resilience in uh, collaboration. Again, that is what's so threatening about things like mutual aids to, uh, to these larger systems at play um, is, is that we'll no longer depend on them. We'll just depend on each other. We'll, we'll depend on you know, smaller communities building these networks amongst each other. Um, and that's very scary to, to especially to like the intelligence community, it seems. And then they use the disruption from the intelligence community as like proof of how it doesn't work. Like if you just let this thing grow and build a little bit more and more and more, you'll see like why it's beneficial and why it works. But the intelligence community, like Jay and Her Jay or Hoover coming in and using COINTELPRO um, to try to like break these groups apart is is what creates the failure in the first place. Like the Black Panthers wouldn't. I'll rephrase this: the Black Panther survival programs wouldn't have failed had the FBI just left it alone, but they didn't. And it was like scary for the FBI. They were like, they're, they're fucking feeding people and they're, and they're taking care of the sick people and they're, and they're getting hospital rides for them and shit. This is crazy. They're, they're going to destroy America like this. <laughs> Ugh. Mutual aid shows you that there is more than enough to go around and that we all have more in common than the elites and the bosses who would have you believe it's much easier to organize around other issues when that rapport is built, said Seema Lee, who emphasized that long-term effects of the coronavirus are going to be felt for months, maybe years. Uh, I fully expect to see rent strikes and uh, more after so many neighbors have connected uh, over the disaster of mutual aid during the COVID-19. Um, the crisis is bigger than the virus. The crisis is 400 years of white supremacist capitalism, and uh, all the contradictions are falling apart before our eyes. We have to start now deciding what things will look like long after this is over. And, and that's true. We have to think about like what the next step is going to be, right? We, we can't really reopen the states without uh, proper testing, proper treatment treatment plans for what happens when people come into play, how are, how are, how are we going to handle this medically and economically? Um, and those plans exist, and they're out there, and they are currently being declined by both political parties uh, that are at play. You know, you, you have one candidate that's kind of doing a weird fucked up version of Medicare for all. And then another candidate who is the Democrat that literally said that he'd veto the bill if it ever came down to it. If it ever came down to it, Congress agrees that we need to pass Medicare for all. That's the only way we can get through it. He straight up said he'd veto it because he quote, trust what the pharmaceutical industry wants to do. It's like, you can't move forward without having a plan to, to identify what the problems were in all of these little sectors and then come up with a solution for them. Like, you're just like, yeah, but there wasn't a problem. And it was like, no, but there is. And it's like, yeah, but not if I do this. What if I do this? If I do this, there's no problem. <laughs> right? Like, it's kind of insane the way that they do this. <laughs> so, uh, all right. The impact of mutual aid efforts can do far more than meet immediate health needs. They can build the kind of government bonds uh, that all mass movements emerge from. The willingness to stand in solidarity and struggle as a community. Uh, as, as weeks turn into months, we potentially enter a new era of recession, job losses, and evictions. Those relationships have been f uh, formed doing mutual aid. So mutual aid can also be used <laughs> to push for a deeper, more systemic change that is so desperately needed. End of article. And, and it's true. I, I do think that we are going to be in a uh, state of collective, I don't know. Um, it's like collective trauma. Like we're all kind of in this fucked up situation together. So we will come out of this, like I think with a, with a lot more understanding of solidarity. In my opinion, I think that's that's, probably what's um, what's likely to come 
um, is all of us are going to come out and and realize that we all kind of need to depend on each other. Like, you know, and, and this is one of the things like I have a I have a friend of mine, uh, Lee Camp, who who I, uh, you know, help with this website and social media and stuff. So he will he will, you know, pay me to do that sort of thing. And I basically was like, hey, I'm kind of doing less work on that department. Um, so why don't you just give what you would normally pay me directly to the D.C. mutual aid? Uh, because I'm kind of doing OK in terms of the fact that, like, I don't really have uh, rent to worry about or f or overwhelming amounts of food to worry about. And I've got, a you know, a little bit of financial stability, um, but I know there's other people that don't. And that's kind of the way we have to take care of each other. And this is my way of kind of paying it forward is there have been a lot of people that have been incredibly kind and generous to me and uh, especially like in these trying times. And I want to give back a little bit. And so that was that was kind of my contribution. Um, so, you know, if you if you know there there is a mutual aid somewhere in your in your uh, in your neighborhood, uh, help them out, you know, a volunteer to be somebody that, you, that can be connected. Uh, for somebody that needs some aid, if you have the ability to donate to them, donate to them. Uh, if you got some extra food, 40% uh, of food goes to waste, uh, globally speaking. And a lot of that, and, and I think 40% of what goes to waste comes from the distribution network. Like it gets uh, ruined in transport um, or it doesn't look pretty enough. Um, so, you know, if you have a little bit, if you have a little bit more, um, help somebody out. Let's look at your comments. Uh, can you do a whole show in your government voice doing a complete <laughs> parody of our state and federal government's public stances on statements? <laughs> yes, I'm going to have to go back and listen to what that government voice is so I can like, I can do it on command because I think I just tap into it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I, I, I will, I will try to do that. <laughs> that does sound fun. Uh, trust, yeah, trust the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, Joe Biden literally said that he would decline Medicare for all because one, look at Italy is what he said, which I don't think is an accurate viewpoint. Although I have to do more research on that end of what happened with Italy's healthcare system. But he did literally come out with just like the finance, the pharmaceutical industry knows what it's doing and we should just trust them <laughs> that it was just like dude you are losing it way way more than what people anticipate <laughs> uh in the last comment america in general is very apathetic uh not sure how much radical change the masses will push for yeah you know i have been thinking about that a whole lot um i've had uh, a lot of conversations that sometimes turn very angry in regards to someone like Joe Biden, who like, I, I don't like him. And I, and like, my decision is like, Trump's not my candidate. Biden's not my candidate. So I'm kind of in like, I don't know what I'm going to do when November rolls around. Like I have the green party and, and, and the libertarians. And I guess I'll, I'll try to see if any of those candidates, um, you know, kind of match what I believe in, but a lot of like very intelligent people, will just not do something different. Like when I ask, when I ask these very intelligent people like, Hey, will you vote for a third party? Because Joe Biden doesn't match with any of the policies or any of the things that you believe in. They kind of circumvent back to that lesser of two evils, most important election. And like the same thing over and over again, it's just like, well, wait a minute, weren't you a Bernie supporter that believed in like radical change and making all the difference and like the revolution and all this other shit. And but they but yeah you're right it's just there is there is apathy when there is somebody that i think um everybody can funnel their their fervor into we're all gung-ho about it but the second that person kind of disappears then we're all just like well we'll just do what status quo has always told us to do um uh, which you know, if you look at the pattern of things, like it just fucking doesn't work. <laughs> kind of sucks. Like status quo kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's very interesting. Like I, I, I want people to be less apathetic and all of these other government systems that we, that, that I've looked into or any sort of like community effort, um, 
or social radical gov government structures that I've looked at is like, yeah, they make you more involved in the political process and more involved in like what pieces of legislation and what policies are actually going to do and how they affect uh, people's lives. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, that I think that's very important. Not just the U S yeah, I, I think, I think they're like, what's the, neoliberalism is a, is a global, is a global phenomenon. Um, I, you know, so, and, and I do hear it from everywhere is I'm part of like different countries, free thinker groups. Um, and I got into a thing the other day that I'll probably end up writing about is, and it was basically that, like they were using DNC talking points, right? Like MSNBC talking points. And I don't think these people are dumb. Like, I think they're very intelligent people. And I legitimately think that they are, they do believe that what they're doing is the right thing. Uh, for people, like for humanity, and which which it's, you know, it's unfortunately not. But I think part of that is like, yeah, they they part of it is they're set in their apathetic ways. Uh, tough vote this time. Vote for Biden uh, is the hope. Sits uh, get Trump out or, or vote third party that will lose, and assuredly leave Trump in office in hopes uh, that it causes a stir even within the Dems. Yeah, that's kind of the hope. I think you're right. Um, you know, I think if enough of the, if, if enough of the lefty votes go to a third party, like the green party, um, and even then, like, I know there's a bunch of people that voted for Trump that are just super fucking pissed at everything that he's doing. Uh, if they vote for a libertarian candidate and we see like, you know, you know, 30% for the libertarians, 30% for the greens, and then less and less for like what what's going to happen if that if that's the case you know like what what's going to happen if a large number of people start voting third party like it's going to scare the shit out of the DNC it's going to scare the shit out of the Republican party like and and that is kind of the hope is every single time that i've seen the or the spoiler argument right to me it's not a spoiler argument to me it's a wake up call that that both of these parties should be looking at um and it's and it's it's very frustrating to be like no look look at the fact that there is a large number of people who are not oh who who the Democratic Party is not owed their votes <laughs> like they're not owed your votes uh, you should you should look at that and be like we have displaced all of these people um, and I have to think like how many people that wanted to vote for the Green Party but like you said the third parties are likely to lose and they are likely to lose right now. Um, but if you can put a, if I, I did a whole thing about why, why third parties need to be in a presidential election to get federal funding. It's one of the weird loopholes that they have in, in the rules. Um, that's why though, but if you get them federal funding, they become a legitimate candidate. So they're, they're trying to create a narrative that blocks that legitimacy to the, to the political party. Uh, and keeps that duopoly in place. I mean, they're, but they're, the DNC and the RNC are both corporations that run the election, and they both have like lobbyists that sit in their <laughs> that sit on their boards, like corporate lobbyists that sit on their boards. Like it's crazy. So, uh, but they don't they don't want the Green Party or the Libertarian Party to have any sort of legitimacy. So they will do anything they can, even just to block that five percent to get them federal funding. Uh, that will give the Green Party and uh, the DNC a lot more legitimacy um, and a lot more strength. So, Uli, I'm in the same situation, uh, talking a lot back and forth with Europe and get disappointed a lot. Yeah, I think, but, you know, I've been thinking about what to do about these these frustrations. And honestly, like reading about these mutual aids does give me a lot of hope because I have believed in uh, grassroots um, ground floor uh movements i think can really start driving some change and i hope that i hope that i'm wrong about people's apathy i hope that people you know will take a look at some mutual aid groups uh, i've been trying to find one in pittsburgh where i live that i can you know maybe um uh, find out if i can be of any service to them or or, or what have you like uh you know, like how much of my energy I can donate to them. I would love to, or, or even just highlight the fact that they exist. Um, 
I've been doing that a, a, a little bit here and there, you know, and it's, and it is, it is frustrating um, to have to deal with these very intelligent people that are going to go against everything that they believe in, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, this is going to be the last comment and then I'm going to wind down the, the live video. Um, only depends on how many Republicans don't vote the party line compared to the last election. I think the Dems are very nervous about that, even more than Republicans. Yes, that is one thing I will say about the Republicans is that they vote straight down that party line pretty through and through. Like for for somebody, for, for a political party that fucking hates socialists as much as the Republicans do, boy, do they believe in solidarity, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but they do like they, they do they go down the party line i know a bunch of republicans that i've met because here's the thing it's like republicans come to my shows it's kind of crazy and they show up and they listen and then they come up and and they say they didn't agree with me but they liked the fact that i said a bunch of shit or i made them think or whatever it is and i'll talk to them and they were you know they'll they'll tell me here here's what, what here's eight things i don't like about trump Here's what I don't like about his attitude. Here's what I don't like about his business practice. But he was part of the Republican Party, so I got to do it. Like, it's crazy to me. Um, and I think part of that is because, you know, it's like either you go with the Republicans or you have the Tea Party, which I think like any sort of physically responsible Republican is not willing <laughs> to go that far over to the right. You know, like, like these Nixon Republicans or these Reagan Republicans can't make that shift over to, to, to that far over to the right. So it's like, what do they do? They got to vote for whoever the party tells them to vote for. Um, uh, unless there's a, a viable libertarian candidate that, uh, you know, um, I, I, I wasn't a big fan of Gary Johnson. I felt like Gary Johnson had way too many gaps in that election. But yeah, I, you know, if they have like a decent li libertarian candidate, maybe they'll veer away from voting the party. And if that does, that's going to hit the, hit the Republican party, uh, just as, just as hard as, you know, if, if anybody does a writing campaign for Bernie or votes for, um, votes for, for, uh, a, a third party. So yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be an interesting election, I think. But uh, I am going to call it there. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed this thing, please, please share it. Let the, let the people know. Get, hit that like button. Uh, make sure you tell some folks. Um, I've changed my schedule of how I'm doing these videos. I'm not doing them every day because I'm going to be working on the virtual show, the three different forkful pieces that I have that I have to write, record, and produce. Uh, my weekly podcast, plus these videos, that's a lot of shit. Uh, and I've got an album coming out too. So I am going to be doing these uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Um, I'm going to go live. I'm going to continue to go live every Sunday, but I will also probably go live this week only on Saturday as well. So this coming Saturday, I'll go live. Um, and uh, yeah. That's so I'm, I'm kind of changing up my schedule so I can concentrate a little bit more on all these other projects and not uh, overwhelm the shit out of myself. That has been a problem that I've uh, experienced in the past before. Uh, thank you guys for tuning into this one. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, till till the next time, we'll see you on the road. Bye, guys.